Hi, my name is Benedict. Um, oh, first things first, um, this is going to be a tutorial on building um, pads mostly in uh, the lovely new algorithm FM synthesizer from Reason Studios, for Reason Studios, to be run in Reason Studios. I've said Reason Studios enough. Um, housekeeping, it is incredibly hot. We're probably going to have massive thunderstorms in an hour or so. So I've got doors and windows open and a fan going. If you notice any of this stuff, I have to live with it. Algorithm. Going to focus more on pads, so none of that sort of paint strippery, whack, whack, wubba, wubba kind of thing. Um, there'll be plenty of other people showing you that kind of stuff. I can't do it, honestly. I don't even like it. I can't do it. So we will start with we introduce what's called an operator. Everything in FM is done in operator. It all seems very strange. I'll try and simplify it as much as possible. People say they're going to make it simple and they make it seemingly complex. There's a lot of maths in here, but we don't need to think about it too much. Other housekeeping. Going through a couple of processes. I built a tilt EQ for myself. I was really just playing around with that. Uh, and that is quite simply it will make things more trebly or more bassy. Uh, you might see me use it, might not, but it's there. Because FM's a little dry and we're making a pad, we really want to fill that out. So a little bit of a modulating delay. Oh, I wonder who that cat is. He makes a very good VST. And a bit of reverb. So you can hear what each part is bringing. So overall, nice big, round, pleasing sound. So, FM. FM is an additive form of synthesis. Subtractive synthesis is about starting with a really busy oscillator sound, a sawtooth or something like that, lots and lots of overtones, buzzers, what have you. You then want to get rid of that. You're trying to get rid of it and make it more warm and you use a filter. There's a whole lot of math we could say involved with that, but basically you're hacking off the top bits, the trebly bits that you don't like. FM works completely the other way around. You start with the bassy part of the sound, which is the fundamental. So when I'm playing a middle C, we're only hearing a sine wave on middle C. We're not hearing any of the overtone stuff. We're just hearing the, the sub bass. Which of course makes it a pretty boring sound and all but inaudible as we get into the low notes because there's nothing for the old ear to hang on to. What we then do with FM to make it interesting, and you've got to have some sense of how this works, not the math, but some sense of how this works, is that we then introduce another oscillator. And we call them operators because they all operate on each other. They do stuff to each other. They're like family. They, they spend their time aggravating each other into doing other things, getting each other bent out of shape. So we put in a second one of those. Only we don't want them all on the same frequency as a general rule of thumb. So here how that is this exactly the same so we can automate that we don't need to apply two fingers just do it with one finger winning already but that's with both of these going out so we've routed one of these oscillators to our mixer board we've routed the other one to our mixer board and then we're just going to say okay how do I mix those so that they sound good let's go with a third one and that's going to be the next octave up, just up here. You can't see that key, but I'm sure you can work it out. That's there. Oops, we'll just break that. So it's going out as well. And we can set the level of that. So that's me actually playing one, two, three notes all at once. Only doing it with one finger. I just get cleverer by the moment. That's pure additive synthesis, where we're saying we've got our fundamental and then we're adding in the overtones or harmonics of that series. Gets complex, 
go read all about overtones and harmonics. It's actually it's not fun at all. We can balance those out. That is essentially what FM synthesis is based upon, only rather than us hearing them all directly, we use them to operate or exert pressure upon each other. So as I said before, family bend each other out of shape. FM synthesis is about using one oscillator bit to bend another oscillator out of shape. And that's how we do that, by wiring them up. So quite simply saying, I want you, Mr. Four, to mess up with, to mess with Mr. One. By messing with him, we will get a different result. He, it makes, it excites him, it makes him stressed, so he moves faster. So he goes from being cool and mellow. Um, easy like a Sunday morning. To being. Oh no! I feel all evil. That's it. That's FM synthesis. So one excites another. If we change our harmonic series, the overtone that we're using, then we just bend poor Mr. One further out of shape until we get above the Nyquist frequency, in which case he's just plain bloody insane. Uh, if Nyquist really bothers you, then you can work at a higher sample rate. Have fun with it. So, if we get him out of the game, if we're looking to make a pad sound, you can make pads with pretty fast in uh, attack sounds, but generally, let's say, no, we don't want that. We want something that's got a real slow fade in. Beautiful. We've now made the perfect quintessential FM pad sound. I'll just put a little bit of velocity on this, just so we're not always hammering out at full volume, just as we're starting to increase the amount of stuff that we're doing. By having those effects on it, we've now made this interesting. We've added a whole lot of extra stuff, which you can get into with mixing modes. If we start to add in a That's just adding a little bit of harmonic. Let's hit the old F2 and drag that in. Probably not going to leave this here all the time because it just gets a bit old. But we've, if we look at what we're looking at here, so I'm just trying to make sure it's not in my head. Actually, I guess it can live there. It can live there. It's not bothering me. So we are nothing but our sine wave. And the more of those that we have happening at once, the more yeah it gets, the more like an emo song it gets. You may have noticed there that when I let go, it goes blah, blah. And that's because this keeps playing. It's got a fair amount of release and this has got an instant release. So the obvious thing that happens there that people will show with FM is they will do this kind of thing. But of course it works oppositely as well. Or... Now, really take time to play with that. You rush into FM synthesis and don't do your basics, don't really understand what's happening there. You just go, hey, I'm going to turn those bloody knobs and I'm going to be a master at this in seconds. You'll be dead. You'll be like, this sucks. This sucks. This is the suckiest, suckful thing ever in the history of sucking. Yeah, it is because you haven't got the basics. Get the basics inside. Once you've got them, it gets easier. It's not always fun, but it gets easier. 
So if we want our tone to be static, we set our level So the amount that this operator is bugging the bejesuses out of operator one is happening straight away. It's happening all the time and it's still happening when we let go. So we get an even. Tone the whole way through. Simple. It's different from Subtractive, simply because this is always adding. It's constantly doing multiplication by. That's all it is. There's a, there's a big times sign in the middle of that bit of string there, going this times that. Obviously, we can then look to have our pad open and close partially. muted tones. We can, but notice how the release suddenly isn't quite as good. That may be what you're looking for, a bit more of a chopped or scooped release, but if you're not, then just leave that one all the way up there. We can play with our harmonic. The higher we go with our harmonic, generally the less of it you want. That's not a you have to do this kind of rule because I'm not big on those, but as you see, you don't need a lot to be getting. A nice result from that. Now we can add, obviously, many more operators. And it's up to us where that operator joins the fray, so to speak. So remember, this is a lot like family. We've got all our family members getting on the nerves of one family member here. Obviously, this is going to be the black sheep of the family because they're the one that's going to crack and go on a killing spree. At the moment, not connected. We output it, but we don't want to output that. Oh, jeez. That's so yesterday. We can obviously apply it now just to this. So this one is applying pressure on this one, which is applying pressure on this one. So in terms of family dynamics, this is clearly black sheep. Black sheep's brother, black sheep's brother's wife. Scary indeed. So That means nothing's coming through because this one is FM to this one. There's no direct connection between the brother's wife and the black sheep because she's just not that kind of person who operates directly. She operates through her husband, black sheep's brother. This were instant. You can hear it opening up. This one's doing its thing straight away. This one's taking a while to open up. If we have both of them do that, then we end up with quite an evolving sound so long as they're both doing it at different times. This one's taking longer to open up, so you can hear that towards the end as it tops out. And that's one of the real beauties of FM synthesis. That we can have quite a long 
evolving sand with quite a small amount of work. And initially you go, oh, geez, Vag, that wasn't a small amount of work. That was bloody horrifying. Yes, until you grok, you know, just instinctively understand inside yourself what each of these moves is doing and how it works. We could disconnect the brother's wife for the moment. So she's operating on nothing. Cut out of the family, probably the best thing for her or for everyone else. We can now move her so that she's bypassing the brother and operating straight on the black sheep. Get rid of that. Hear how that's not as toppy, it's not putting as much scary stuff up here. So we've got a more muted sort of a sound. Smoother. More new agey. That all depends on what you want to achieve. We can even do both. We can have her doing what any good sister-in-law would be doing, which is to mess with her husband and the black sheep of the family and have the husband exert pressure on the black sheep of the family at the same time. It don't, it don't get any more family than this. So notice we've got the, the muted sound, but we've also got the kind of stuff coming through as well. And that gives us a huge amount of control. We might say, look, I'm going to back both of these off. That's still a bit much for you. You can back both off. This is essentially using a filter. Absolutely lovely. What we might choose to do is to put a lot more of this back in and then apply a velocity. We'll get rid of the velocity here. So the more I velocitate the key, the more of this gets to play its evil game. Which means that you can, when you finish making a mess of things, have velocity applied to several different layers at once. hopefully notice there you've got quite a lot of variety in the playability of the sand that that sand is is capable of going from very muted to raspy just with the attack of the old fingies this is used in pads very much used and and part of the reason why the dx7 was so successful especially in brass emulation or brass creation because sometimes you were emulating what a horn would really do. Sometimes you're emulating what you'd love a horn to do but couldn't or wouldn't. Um, either is perfectly okay. Um, uh, uh, Don Henley, Sunset Grill. Tremendous synth DX7 brass section solo in there, which is just like a brass section couldn't wouldn't play it like that. But once you get over the fact that it's quite out there, the very 80s, in a, in a superb way, it's just such a wonderful use of an instrument for its own sake. You know, it's, it's like you'd only do it with a DX7 sort of thing. That is the basics of what we do. Now, you may be thinking, well, but I want this to be more interesting. Okay, we can be as interesting as you want. 
you'll see here that initially, just get this one out of the game. We're working on very even pitchings or placements of our harmonic overtones. We can work on very uneven. Without a face, perhaps. Hopefully, you know enough Billy Idol to know what that was. If not, you'll really need to go listen to some Billy Idol, <laughs> if nothing else, to hear it done right. So, you've got this point something on the other end. That means we've got the f harmonic one, which is one up, plus whatever that is. So let's say a quarter. Now we don't really have a quarter here. You, you can't divide that by a quarter or maybe one, two, three. Maybe it's sort of there. So C, C up and then an E. But it's not as tidy. It's just kind of weird. It's pure math. And the math with notes is not actually as pure as you think it is. So you get this strange clangorous sound, which is the term always applied to it, which is what you get with a bell, especially a cracked bell, as in its overtone series is now broken. It's not perfectly one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, as many as we can go, even past Nyquist, because the real world doesn't have it. It's probably why it's so scary out there. But one of the problems with that is that It's a cool sound, but it's also out of tune. You've really got to try to, to, to work out how to balance that. You can put in more good, perfect harmonics, or you can do things like um, putting your kooky harmonic up higher. So that's how you get your scraped metal feel. But wait, boys and girls, there is more. One of the features of algorithm, which is nice, is that you can have linear, which is just straight maths. You can have locked to or quantized to a step. See, it does nothing until it's gone across the threshold to be whatever the next official step would be. Or you've got fade. Exactly, ugh, wrong button. Exactly how the math works, not 100% sure, don't really need to know. But what it, is it does is it does some kind of nice, comfortable crossfade between this perfect one and this perfect one. Or maybe it should be the other way around. This perfect one and then the higher one. Oh, it's backwards, too hard backwards. And so you end up with... It being able to give you the advantage of some of those odd harmonic intervals, but without them seeming always so out of tune. So somehow it controls them back. Maths, don't know, don't care. But if you're looking for the advantage of unusual overtones whilst minimising the damage done by being out of tune, you can go into fade mode. And it gives you a lot of ability to be flexible between which you wouldn't have had before. Well, that's cool. It is out of tune. This is more cool than this. You might go, there's not a lot of difference, and just right, there is not a lot of difference, but it's a way of getting some of the advantage of the out of tune harmonics 
without having to suffer all the disadvantages of it sounding like horrid. So of course you can mix and match here, you've got both in fade, but that one's the higher one. get a nice sort of thing. We'd probably want to do a little less of it for comfort. Turn those down. And that's how we get our massive range of tones and movement of tones over time. We can get clever with our movement of tones. Actually, we'll start with a, an LFO. Oh, actually, before we do that, we'll do the LFO to pitch. Now, LFO to pitch is the pitch of the whole instrument here, so it'll take every single operator and move them up and down. If you move only one operator up and down, you're changing that relationship between them, which is the equivalent of having, let's say, a dead grandmother who manages to still influence everybody in the family, even though she's not there always happens. So we can take our LFO1 and apply it to overall vibrato. That's what a DX7 did. Obviously that feeds and plays very well with your delays. So that's a modulating delay. If you had just a straight digital delay, no movement whatsoever in it, so like a DDD1, uh, then by putting vibrato on here, you're kind of doing the same as the modulating delay, putting vibrato on of its own. So you end up with the two of them playing off against each other. Therefore, chorusing over time. Uh, if you're applying a vibrato and a modulating delay, then, excuse me, your, your chorusing uh, waveform, like the waveform shape that you are using for your chorus, becomes more complex rather than just being a nice, neat sine wave. It's now a pair of sine waves working together, which is essentially soft noise. So they... around, which is very nice. So if you're thinking, gee, I, I need to make my my pad sound seem just out that little bit thicker, that little bit deeper, a little bit of vibrato, vibrato. Let's look now what we can do with our pitching. Let's pick operator. That they they numbered slightly oddly seven. I know I can do the drag and drop. But to be honest, I don't love doing that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that's going to here. LFO two, that's this little. affected by these. The straight shapes at higher speed and high settings not overly usable in this format. Paint stripper people will tell me otherwise but they get ugly which is why they like them but why I don't like them. So even that subtle effect is is causing us some Interestification. And as long as it's subtle there, we find that we get an extra layer of depth or movement to that sound. 
amounts are small amounts. Almost everything in FM is small amounts and um, and generally slow if you're doing that to just have that sense of because it, it becomes very apparent in the mix and I think it's far more apparent in the mix than I'm hearing in my headphones. <laughs> the other thing of course is to get into more interesting shapes. So that's emulating the idea of having another LFO control the rate of LFO2. Great for sound effects, but not useful that much in pads. So it goes fairly nicely, but you get all those sort of complex harmonics in there. You can also use your curve things, which are these fellas, set them as they are, make them do interesting things. Bricks. write it all back together depending on what you want out of your pad if your pad if you want a more aggressive take up lots of space then obviously plenty of that happening is is a good thing if you're just looking for a little bit of sheen you want to drop that right back in there best off not having that do any FM at all, just output it. Although we could always be interesting. And use feedback. Now feedback seems complex it's nothing to well yes it is it is actually the same feedback as Jimi Hendrix whacking his guitar into the amplifier into the cab sound goes from the guitar through the amplifier which makes it louder puts it at the speaker the speaker causes the the strings to vibrate on the guitar which goes back through the amplifier which makes it louder which puts it through the speaker which makes the strings vibrate until it howls like a bastard. The feedback in FM synthesis is essentially the same. We can take the signal out of something, feed it back to itself. So in other words, what it's doing is it's stressing itself out, winding itself right up, which sister-in-law definitely does. Be 
Redback's designed fairly carefully inside of him, Synthesis, so it doesn't go ideally straight into screaming absolutely insane, killing the neighbours and laughing about it. Uh, it. It works a little bit more subtly than that, but it can fairly quickly transition from a little bit of hmm to noise, just like <laughs> So if you've got too much, then you're running too much level here or too much feedback level here. Everything's related to everything else because it's taking the output of that and feeding it back to itself. So if you've got velocity on something, the harder you play, the more feedback there will be. So the louder the chord that Jimmy plays right in front of his cab means that there's going to be more feedback and it'll be nastier feedback. Whereas if he plays a nice high note up here, ping, it will give us a nice ping and squeal on that. That's um, Judas Priest kind of territory of that. Bon Jovi, Richie Sambora was good at that kind of stuff, the pings and squeals through controlling what's happening with that feedback. Guitarists can be more specific about that doesn't really matter but feedback just takes something out and puts it back around again you can feed anything back to anything it does say in the manual the rules with regards to it they have to be rules because otherwise the world will explode but basically feedback um, will be prone to making something sound a little bit a little bit cooler until it turns into noise not much in between <laughs> come along and bring in another operator oscillator this one we'll bring in straight away we can route that let's say we want to route it to here because our second here is a little on the bland side let's go with something that's got a little bit more actually no, let's go with something that's got a lot less so that's one octave below Half is one octave below. We might even say, let's let's really take a fair bit of time on this fellow. A, a kind of a not a sub but it adds a sort of bump underneath um, but it does it in a way that's kind of like taking your bass guitar line that's very sine wavy and giving it a tube crunch by putting it into a tube to create those overtones which are going to be sort of somewhere up here gives you a kind of a nasal thing that fills in here. We've now got quite a busy, sophisticated sound. Let's add ourselves another oscillator. Oh, there are other things in here. I might or might not touch on them. If I, if I don't touch on them, it's just because they're not as necessary to understanding basic FM and how to get the results. Play with them. They'll make more sense once you get into them because they're not really any different from the other kind of synthesis, Thor, what have you, that you're already used to. They're just available in here, which is cool, which is a good thing. Nothing against them. They're, they're good that they're there. Let's now give ourselves a sound that behaves quite differently. Can't 
and a little sine wave electric piano. Obviously this depends entirely on what you're trying to do. If you've got a, an otherwise busy mix, then you may not want that little ping on the front because your busy mix is dealing with that. But if you're allowing yourself quite a minimal mix, then putting that on the front gives a lot of definition to what you're playing. But it doesn't have to be there, it can be We can even say, yeah, let's not worry too much about that and do, let's turn it off. We're not going to get a lot of movement here. Actually, we're getting more than I thought, but. We kill off this one up here. just that little at the beginning we put it in subtle a lot of people wouldn't even notice that was there if you if you ask them to very quickly create that sound they'd probably not create the ping on the front but it adds a, a layer of detail that FM synthesis is superbly good at uh, people find that complex to make but this is what led to people trying to solve that whilst giving you the same outcome, which was um, layering of synthesis and Roland then called linear arithmetic LA, which was basically take a, um, a little bit of something on the front, layer it with something else on the back. DX7 um, transforms into D50. I know different manufacturers and what have you, but they were very aware of the success, success of Yamaha's DX7 and had to do something to deal with that because their um, analog keyboards, um, 8Ps and things like that, Jack's 8Ps just weren't really selling anymore. They weren't commanding the market anymore. The Jupiter 8 was over, um, still very highly valued at the time, but people were look, moving on. The JX 8P hadn't pleased a lot of people, while it was in many ways a lovely synth. The thing was, it was so clear, it didn't have all the advantages of it's like a Jupiter 4, and, you know, being big and meaty and fat and more. Um, it was very clean and clear and crystalline, sounding a little like a DX7, but not having any of the advantages of the complexity that we can get out of. So Roland said, how do we do that whilst still having it be simple? And they said, OK, well, what if we give people several layers of almost preset sounds? Uh, and so you could put a piano sound on one layer, a string sound on another layer, put the pair together. And you were actually getting that sound. And that set the tone for, well, even today. Because that's what um, your uh, most of your synths are doing, Omnisphere and what have you, just layers of things all on top of each other. Doesn't make them bad, it's, it's a very fast way of doing things. Very fast indeed. But it doesn't give you the precision of creating it right here inside the machine. That 
that's most of what we can do. There is this control here, FM amount offset. This is the equivalent of a filter inside this paradigm. So we can change the overall amount of FM that's happening in all these FME connections down to nothing. That's just a two pure sine waves. All we're hearing are these two operators, these two oscillators. None of this is in the game at the moment. So if we've said, you know, I like this, this is great, the balance is great, but it's just kind of too much. We can back the whole thing off. Really nice to have that overall master of FM control because it allows us to either play with that in real time. We want to push that in the mix at some stage. And we've got more happening. really nice control. So rather than feeling like, oh, my sound sucks and which one of these knobs is going to fix it, it's great to know. But you might just find that grabbing this knob, the master of more or less will solve your problem. And this one is decay and release. If we pull that right back, All our decay and release sections are set to nothing. So you can hear them all cut off. In pagulation, we may say, look, this is really great, but it's a bit too, a bit too attacky. There's a bit too fast. our attack but our decay and release have now been extended right out there and can really change how our sound behaves inside the piece. So if we feel like, oh geez, I've got too much slush on the, the bottom of this, we can do that when playing quickly. I can cut it back. If I really want to fill up that mix because I'm lazy. That's really quite a useful control. These other controls over here, again, very useful. Very, very useful indeed. The FM amount. Now, these are key scaling. So in other words, just like with Thor, if we set our filter cutoff, our main more or less TB303 knob, it hinges on middle C. If we set it to be zero, then it means that there's no hinging at all. So whatever value we set our filter to will be the same, which means that as we go up the keyboard, our sound becomes less bright. 
often that's a really good solution to stop you from getting really shrill sounds. Other times that's a really poor solution. Uh, and so we want to be able to de-emphasize what's happening here and make the most of what's happening up here, in which case we would turn up our key control. This is a either way, just like these last two controls. So we can set it that, let's say we've got lots of FM happening here. Hear how it's fading away. We can make more of it, we can make less of it. So if we hear that greedily sound that's going on in there because we've got too much FM emanation, but we don't want to get rid of all our FM, it's going to create a rocker from our middle C and do this. Lots of FM, it feels very manly. Clear, pure tones, not too much noise and greebly stuff happening from too much FM. Not perfect in every situation, but quite a handy one, especially with electric pianos and the like. You want to get that sense of balance, left to right hand, your FM rocker. Remember rocking from the center here will mean more or less FM either side of your middle C. The envelope rate is the same thing. Easiest with this fella here. If you have a real piano, you know, like a real one with the felt hammers and what have you, and it's made of wood and all of that, you'll notice that your bass notes ring out for a very long time. And the notes right up here, I don't have the keys for them here because I don't have an 88, but up the top, they're like tick, really short. So this gives you which can sound really nice compared to because it's different as it goes across the keyboard. Of course you can do the opposite, they get short. All depends on what you're trying to achieve, but surprisingly useful knobs and really well worth using them because what they will do is make your sound feel less static across the whole keyboard. The way a violin behaves on its low A uh, and its high A is actually quite different. Same with a guitar with its low E and its high E and then it's whatever it is up here as far as you can go with like it, it's actually quite a different instrument. If you take those two sounds and put them together, let's say you sample them and pitch them across the keyboard, you suddenly go, these two sounds don't belong together at all. But as a whole instrument, it sounds great. So even with pads that might be fairly static, let's put the rest of this in, by changing them across the keyboard, you give them more of a feeling of it being an organic instrument. Mostly is it. Everything else that you might do in terms of um, creating pads is really just messing about. Going, oh, well, what if I added one of these and it was there and, oh, it can affect that. Okay, that's kind of cool. Now, what if I make it do that? Oh, wrong. Always grab the wrong things. Okay, that's kind of 
interesting. So we merely add various different different bits and pieces and see what they do. I should have grabbed the wrong thing before. Oh no, that's right. I had what I had. So now I've put a real sheen on top of everything. It's digitally, but that's one of the real charms of FM, that it can do these things that nothing else can do. You can put it through other processes, make of it what you want. Now here's where we'll get into playing with a tilt filter. If we feel like it's too bright and too up the top, which it kind of is, we can just tilt ourselves a little bit. a little bit more majestic. And that's just become a little bit nicer and cleaner. What we've done here is we've taken 3 or 4 dB off the top and added the same down the bottom. It's all a tilt filter is. lot like that key scaling control. Or we can go the other way around. And for pads, this is a great way of going about things. In that you you've got actual bass in your mix. Blim, 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 blim. You've got your kick drums, so it might be an 808 based thing, so it's it's hella subby. And then you've got this big ass as well. You're nowhere. Real problems. Whereas you can actually roll off quite a lot. We're about 6 dB down, yeah, and about 6 dB up. But as you're playing down here, the brain goes, oh, that's a low sound. So it plays that role in the mix, but it's not cluttering up the mix with a whole lot of bass that, while it sounds tremendously manly, if you've got basses and the like going on as well, you've got nowhere. Plus, you may have noticed, We can hear the movement of the other operators coming in and out. So we can play low, get a real extension of our high frequencies, this stuff. Up here, it could be problematic, but oddly enough, it's not. Yes, we've got a lot of our and they're starting to get a little greebly. But because we've emphasised them, they're not somewhere there and being annoying. We've emphasised them, we're making a feature of them. So they actually sound quite nice. If you really want to, there's nothing to stop you from... So that's giving us that really bright, airy tone, which... See, by contrast, quite midi, like as in mid frequencies. Midi has no sound. Please don't let anyone tell you otherwise. But that's brightening this up and reducing the effect of these, which you could equally do with a... a uh, make go away 
setting, but you tilt filter really nice. A little bit of an idiot proof way to start mixing. Because you can look at a sound and simply go, hmm, do I want to be more bright, less bright? Interestingly enough, if you're playing down here, you're almost always going to go less bright, more manly. And then of course you have problems in your mix. So sometimes doing the complete opposite will give us more control. And a tilt filter is just a super easy way of one knob to rule them all. It doesn't solve all your problems, but it gives you a very quick sense of do I want more of this or less of that. In this case, I also built in, it happened because I realized, oh, I need a trim because obviously sometimes this is going to get too loud. So I need to be able to, to just affect the loudness. And I thought, oh, well, the compressor will be a, a plus minus knob will, will be a good way of doing it. And realized, oh, hang on, you could actually do some compressing as well. Because FM and compression work very nicely together. The reason that FM and comp compression work very nicely together is because what compression does is it doesn't turn the level of everything down the same, not perceptually anyway. It will be keyed because we have no sense of EQing our key, as in what's setting this whole thing into motion. It's keyed by what's the loudest, which is down here. And therefore, it's turning everything down by that. And it's actually reducing the squeakies up here, giving these a little bit more clarity. So FM and compression go together very nicely. And what that has effectively done is this. It's effectively done that. Hear how that sounds quite similar to what the compression had done? So it's actually clarified the detail in here. We've made our sound seem warmer and more detailed at the same time by using the volume of the low end to key and turn everything down, which effectively turns those down more perceptually. So we've made it seem less digital and clinical and more detailed at the same time with compression. So compression and FM are, are good bedfellows. So compression and everything can be good, for good bedfellows, but FM tremendously because it tends to give you a warming effect. So even though we've added a lot here, we've put a sense of control in there, and that control is not static, it's constantly moving based on what's happening in the sound, therefore it seems more organic, less digitally. Even though it's a very digital synth with a very digital sound, it sounds nicer. So that's a big key with pads, but particularly with FM pads where you're looking for that brightness and clarity that, that FM will do in ways that nothing else will do. I'm sure there are many other things that I could show you, but I've probably given you a ton of stuff to go on with there. Again, quick recap. Um, thank you for going ping. Um, don't rush into FM. It is an additive form. People get angry with me for saying that, but they're wrong. You are adding more stuff to your signal. You're starting out with your sine wave. And adding stuff to it. You can do lots of various little operations, put pressure on whichever is outputting. You can have all of them output at once if you so desire. Sometimes that can give you more body, but experiment. Take your time before you get into doing all these other things. Take your time just to learn. 
this relationship. And this relationship. So how they work together, because everything's working on everything else based upon how everything is wired to everything else. And subtlety is such a big key. You can have a sound that seems too much, as I have back here. Just a little bit. See? Lovely in the middle there. I'd probably be getting my EQ. Not you. Ah, wrong button. Keep pressing the wrong button. New keyboard. Still try to settle with it. Where is that? It's it's there. It's where I thought it was. So we might even look to very subtly. little bit of movement right there I want to emphasize rather than going oh I've got to do this which is fine but our sound is less interesting than if we're actually doing this movement that's happening in the middle here and then while well, you might go geez that's that's a bit aggressive not to mention that whole never boost bullshit do whatever you need to do we can take that in the mix and drop it right back and comparatively what we're really going to be hearing is this which is just going to slide straight through the mix. And because it slid through the mix there, the brain's actually going to go searching for the rest of it. And it'll fill it in without the cost of volume within your mix. So you see so many people are going, oh, but I can't get the levels right. Got no EQ whatsoever. And they're pushing up here going, oh, I need more presence. Nah, you probably don't. Let's try doing this. You can pull it right back in the mix and that becomes a lovely subtle little sound. Which obviously it's all entirely mix dependent but that's going to allow you to have this great big pad with a lot going on. And it's going to sound beautiful and full and rich in the mix, despite the fact that you've pretty well sliced it down the middle. You've said, yeah, you're only going to have this much come through. You don't want to do this to it as a general rule. There are times where I've done this sort of thing in a mix. But hear how that's thin, which can be great. That sounds vibrant and warm and expansive, even though we've actually got a you know great big peak in the middle of it. If our mix is too busy, I will do that. I will do that to it and it'll work great in the mix. But chances are you don't need to get that heavy handed. This will do. After you've done your tilt filter. While you come in thinking, 
I want to do this. So just work out what your sound is meant to do in the mix. Um, and that's notes as well. You'll notice I'm always playing different notes. I'm not playing the same note over and over again. There is a tendency out there, especially in EDM land, for them to play the same notes over and over again. The problem with this being that because it's the same, the listener's brain turns it off. Goes, oh, I don't really need to pay attention to that anymore. I know exactly what's happening. The next note's going to be, and the one after that's going to be, and the one after that's going to be. Don't really need to pay attention to that. Maybe there's going to be something interesting go along. Oh, that's not very interesting. Whereas. is interesting because every time we hear that sound it's different cool people try to solve that problem by playing and then applying effects over the top some hamburger helper application that is going to hack it up it doesn't actually solve your problem because after a little while the brain goes hmm it's that with hamburger helper on top and it's just as bored Whereas your solution is exciting every time. So that's there's, there's a lot of tips there. We've looked at the physically making your pad and how FM really benefits us in that. We have looked at the fact that we can apply different algorithms. We can control our overall FME-ness, and that gives us a lot of control over overall tone, timbre, feel, our um, decay and release, that we can key scale rocker over middle C to have more or less FM, top and bottom of the keyboard. Really, really nice stuff. The same with our overall envelope rates, we can make them faster or slower based upon key with the same rocker in middle C, and that really helps our sound seem less samey across the keyboard. That makes it feel more organic, despite the fact that it's digital as digital could be. A um, little bit of LFO to pitch, and the fact that we can apply LFOs to have them do things to certain parts of our operator slash oscillators um, the tilt filter or eq just that we can change the overall tone of our sound in one spot do am i looking for a brighter sound with more clarity or am i looking for a, a, a beefier sound and yet with more clarity as well it's not asking to have both at once which is that smiley filter it's saying it's probably one or the other of these. Which of these half of the rock, or the rocker, is going to give me more of the right sort of feel? So you go, okay, that's that's you know that's the right sort of feel overall. Then you can apply a little bit of this to finish the rest. And of course, the FM loves effects, modulating delays, reverb chorusing as well but be careful you'll see i've left the unison alone going automatically into unison is a bit of a bit of a rookie error um but chorusing can really help if we whack on a, a chorusinator quartet just turn off our EQ. So 
So you get a, just a, a nicer, broader, deeper, more organic feeling sound. It gets furrier, but in a nice way. Mm, cat fur. Uh, but don't overdo it. It's very easy to overdo it and turn your sound into mush. If it's a pad, it's sort of meant to be mush, but it's easy to make the... When that's not what you're actually doing. You optimise your sound when you... Da, da. Amazing. And then in your piece, you're using it up here and going, what happened to it? But uh, chorus is definitely a... A nice way of spreading that sound around. Personally, I think nicer than unison. Play with the unison in here. I'm just not a fan of that immediate press the unison button on everything. 32 instances of the sound spread across the universe. <laughs> just, yeah. Um, so effects, tastefully, EQ, and EQ must be to make this play its role in the mix. And your mix is built from you playing notes. doesn't have to be a lot of movement. One of the great things with pads is that you don't need a lot of movement. It's a very small movement there, but we're getting a different sense of set of harmonics, harmony, out of the fact that I'm playing one set of notes down here and a different set of notes here. If I just played... That's nice. But it's not the same as... That's how we use harmony to our favour. It's like, oh, we've always got a different sense of how these notes are going together. Pianos are wonderful for that. If you're ever trying to work out harmonies, uh, piano samples are nowhere near as good, but they're still okay. But if you're wanting to work out uh, at harmonies and how they seem to go together, get a real piano if you can. They're a really hard thing to live with. So go borrow somebody else's, you know, go go over your, uh, your mate's grandma's place and play her piano and then leave her to it when you're done with it because they're a pain in the ass to live with. But you'll be amazed how much you can hear on a piano. Pianos are really wonderful for doing that. But in the meantime, absolutely nothing wrong with using your synthesizers. Obviously, you can hear exactly what's going to work. So, interesting. So we can keep it fairly simple. The other stuff that's happening can be fairly simple, but a few simple things working together in terms of harmony, we get this feeling of really nice and broad and, and, and rich and textured. We don't get rich and textured from the sound itself anywhere near as much as we do from transitioning across different notes. That's how we get our sound. It's not sounds, it's actually how they're played that gives you an awful lot. So that's the, 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 the last tip, because I'm done. I hope you've had fun with this. If there are questions, ask them down here. If you're interested in uh, sounds that I have made, there is um, a um, refill by me. Um, oh, what's, what's this? Um, nice sounds your children to, to the um, to, to, uh, nice sounds to upset your children with isn't that embarrassing can't remember the name of my own refill nice sounds to upset your children with which is 100 percent algae rhythm algae rhythm you have a good day now